from Apex, bro. It's, it's at the top of the food chain. You know what I'm saying? This week on Kentucky Afield, we went live on Facebook to answer all of your fishing questions. And we're bringing you those answers right now. It's all next on Kentucky Afield. Such a pretty fish. Beautiful. This pond is plumb loaded with frogs. They're everywhere in here. <laughs> yeah, this is a good fish right here. Really good fish. Come here, girl. Hey, boy. That's a big rabbit. Nice job. Yes! Yes! <laughs> My first musket. <laughs> Here it goes! Boom! Oh, oh. Wow, that happened fast. Hello and welcome to Kentucky Field. I'm your host Chad Miles. Tonight we are coming to you live via Facebook to answer all of your fishing questions. I know you might be thinking, wow, there's a foot of snow on the ground, there's a pandemic going on, but that won't stop you from getting out there and fishing because I'll tell you, the best time to fish is from now for the next three months. So we want to make sure we get this show out early. In years past, we put this show out in March, and I really felt like that we were missing some of the best months and best times to go fishing. So here to answer all your questions, we have our normal pa panel here. We have uh, Jeff Ross, who is our fisheries biologist. How you doing today? Good, good. We also have Jeff Crosby, who is the Central District Fisheries Biologist. How you doing? Doing well, thank you. And we have Sergeant Blackwell, and he is out of the fourth district. Yes. So let's get started here. First question up, Doug from Union, Kentucky. Doug is from Wisconsin and he uh, is used to fishing weed lines, uh, but he's having trouble finding them here in Kentucky. He said he's fished Taylorsville and Laurel Lakes and it seems like they're mostly rocky bottoms. So he likes to fish weed lines. A little different terrain, different vegetation up there. Tell him what he can expect and where to find that here in Kentucky. Well, a lot of our lakes are kind of, uh, we'll say, turbid to some degree, so that is not really conducive for good vegetation. We do have lakes around the state that do have vegetation, you know, Cave Run Lake. Um, you know, there's been at times, you know, out west at Kentucky Barkley, I think, due, again, due to certain weather conditions, the more rain we get, the more turbid the water the less amount of vegetation that we'll see. So weather does play a little bit of part in that, but we do have a few lakes. Del Hollow has some really nice, uh, beautiful, beautiful lake that has some really great weed beds in it and, and areas of the lake. Uh, but uh, a lot of our smaller lakes uh, tend to have a lot more vegetation than our bigger ones. You know, I have fished up north and they are, there are areas that have just tons of grass and weed beds. Usually, from people who fish in Kentucky, the questions we get is about removing vegetation mm -hmm. because it can overtake lakes and become problematic and you can move invasive vegetation from lake to lake. So that's typically what we're dealing with. But there are good vegetation for fishing. Tell me what is native here in Kentucky that are, that are areas, if you find it, you go, you know what, this is the kind of grass you want to fish. What would you look for? Uh, I think uh, around this area, uh, the, uh, the submerged pond weeds, uh, mm -hmm and uh, things like coontail mm -hmm. uh, where are, are native and uh, are great uh, weed beds that, that hold fish. They don't get too dense. That's mm -hmm. the problem with a lot of our invasive, uh, like hydrilla or uh, some of these, uh, or curly leaf pond weed. They get really matted up, really thick. They're really difficult to fish and really you're just fishing the edges. But uh, a lot of these other, you know, more native for are, are more open, easier to fish, more clumped at times. But uh, again, looking at smaller lakes, more clear lakes, because that it, uh, clear water is kind of the key mm -hmm. to uh, having a lot of that vegetation. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you know, it's sometimes it's kind of hard to find, especially when we have a lot of rain. I'll tell you what, if you find it certain times of year, you have found where the fish are at. They can really hold some schooled fish, that's for sure. Next question is from Robert Parker, and he wants to know if there's a list of lakes that are stocked with catfish and when they are stocked. We get this question quite often about stocking. Tell us what we, what we do provide on the website and then what we may have if they call and ask. Right, so we have uh, the Fins Lakes for sure. We have a, mm -hmm. you can go on our site and look up fishing in the neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And that lists our catfish and trout stockings and it actually gets specific on dates 
when we get closer. And I know some, we've had in the past people asking about like catfish stockings. Mm -hmm. When do you do those? And we've shifted those around each year and I think we're gonna settle on the fall, but we really can't give an exact date. Uh, for a list of the lakes that we stock, uh, we have a new map and Jeff knows better on where that's located. Yeah, under on our website, if you go to that fish tab and then you go to the recreational fishing, uh, if you'll kind of go to the all the page for that, uh, about halfway, uh, two thirds of the way down, you'll see a, a section on stocking. And it's um, one of our biologists does a really great job. Uh, it's a map of the state and it's got uh, dots on the, the state for every stocking. Mm -hmm. uh, that we do, and, it, and you can click on that dot. It actually, it looks like a little fish icon, uh, and uh, it'll give you what water body that is, how many, f and what species, and how many went in. Uh, and it's based on the year, so okay. you know you can look at the 2019 or the 2020 or, or 2018. I think is what it goes back to, but uh, that information is on the website. A lot of people ask about that, and that's you can find that on our website. So if you're new to fishing in Kentucky or, uh, or, or haven't been to the website, the website uh, that we're referring to here is fw.ky.gov. You go fishing and then recreational fishing. Fishing, right. And, and then you can get to a bunch of maps on there that can find this information. Yeah, the, that gets you a list of a lot of different pages of the recreational fishing you know, the, to look at. But uh, down about halfway to two thirds down, you'll see a section on stocking. I, I tell you what, if you have a favorite lake that you like to fish here in the state of Kentucky and you've not traveled to the website to look at the amount of data that's on there, you you're definitely will learn something. Uh, it's amazing to me when we go to fish lakes that we've never been on before that you can go and look at type of species. You can find, you can if you really want to dig in, you can find uh, survey reports when from shocking, what size species, the number of fish in certain lengths, um, there's a lot of information on there. You can find pl places to fish based on submerged structure that's been put out. It's a really good resource. It can be a bit hard to navigate because there's so much data on there, but I tell you what, if you get on there and start your fishing trip there, you'll probably be happy. Uh, tons of information. Uh, next question is from Bobby Brown, and Bobby Brown wants to know if spoonbill are legal to keep or if they must be released immediately. Uh, yes, they are legal to uh, possess if you have your proper fishing license. Uh, you can have up to two of them. Uh, and then you can, different varieties of ways that you can catch them. A lot of people, especially right now, are doing snagging. Mm -hmm. uh, and once you, if you are snagging paddlefish, once you catch two of them, then you are finished. So you can't, of course, call in here or anything like that. So once you reach your two limit, then you're done. Okay. And you cannot sell the row either. Um, if you do catch one that has row in it, you cannot, it's illegal to sell that. So uh, areas for Spoonbill, Spoonbill, obviously the, some of the river systems, um, mm -hmm. the Ohio River, I'm, if you're talking about snagging, you're probably talking about yes. the Ohio River. Yeah, mainly from uh, the boat ramps on the oh. Ohio's, a lot of people do that. Okay. What, uh, Barclay, what other location would you Barclay recommend? Barclay and Kentucky tailwaters are real popular. Okay. And actually they have a little bit, they allow eight down there and it gets really confusing in our guide. The statewide is two, so keep that in mind, but mm -hmm. there are both those tailwaters, you're allowed to get eight. Okay, okay. Um, but those are probably the most popular outside of the river. I'd say it's amazing how many people who have fished in the state of Kentucky and maybe have never ever seen a spoonbill. Yep. If you see one, you will not forget it. <laughs> it, it you'll realize really quick why they call it a spoonbill. <laughs> it's a very interesting looking fish and uh, they get really big. They can get can. extremely big. I mean, well, the state record is over 100 pounds, right? Mm -hmm. I believe so. Yeah, that's a really, really big fish. All right, next question. Weston Clevenger, and he wants to know what's the best baits to use for smallmouth in rivers during pre-spawn and spawn? Who wants to take this? I guess I'll take a shot at it. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, one of the better baits, I guess, especially, you know, we'll say pre-spawn, which is kind of now till you know, we get into probably into the 60 degree range. Uh, I think any type of plastics work well. Your Ned rigs, you know, small, uh, small swim baits, mm -hmm. I think are gonna be very good to use for small mouth this time of year. Uh, in a lot of these streams. Uh, eventually, I think as the water warms, you can maybe get into more crank baits and spinner baits as the water warms. But uh, I think right now, you know, early pre-spawn, you're looking at, you know, some type of creature bait, 
plastic is mm -hmm. probably going to be a better bait to use. Yeah, I, I fish a lot of the creeks and streams around here for smallmouth, and I'll tell you, this time of year it's a little tough, but as soon as that water starts to warm just the slightest amount, uh, that's when it really starts to turn on. But it's all about how slow you present that bait in that really, really cold water in streams. You take a bait that you, you want to fish a bait that, that you can present in the slowest possible fashion. That's the bait you're going to catch the most smallmouth on early. Now, as they get more aggressive and the water warms, you want to speed up your presentation. And that's when you're talking about crankbaits, swim baits, and stuff like that, right? Next question is from David. Any new Fins Lake scheduled for 2021? There is one. Um, Robert J. Barth in Campbell's, Campbell County, yes. Okay. And that, uh, we won't be stocking that until the fall, and it'll be with trout. Okay. That'll be kind of the kickoff of that lake, but that's up in Campbell County. Okay. And that's the only new one for this year. All right. How many Fins Lakes do we have now? Probably? 44? It's in the 40s. I think it's 44. Okay. 44 That fins. may be the 45th. I may be... Okay. I think that is. So that's, that's a really good program. It's been going yeah. on now for quite some time. Yep, very popular. Um, easy access. We pick the lakes where there's good access, good facilities. Mm -hmm. You know, it makes it easy for somebody to just come from town and head over to the lake and fish. And I'd say what, if, if you're a family or you have some kids or you want to pick up fishing, maybe the COVID-19 provided you some additional time to get outdoors, a Fins Lake is a really good location to go start learning how to fish. Mm -hmm. Go in there, look at when the fish are being stocked, and go right after that for up to a week after that, and it can just be fantastic. Now, you, you know, 45 lakes, there's probably one within a certain distance of your house, especially if oh, you yeah. live in near the urban cities. So it's a great opportunity, a great way to get into fishing. Um, Josh Riley, where is the best flathead fishing in the state of Kentucky located? Depends on where you live, Depends huh? Where you yeah. Live. <laughs> yeah. I think uh, it's it's kind of a big river fish. I think uh, you know the Ohio River is a great place to catch really good flatheads, along, as well as you know the Kentucky, the Green, you know any the riverine portion of those. Uh, I, I mean, you can catch them in a lot of lakes. I know Harrington is a pretty decent lake for flatheads. A lot the area that I work, a lot of people fish for them over there. You know, Nolan, I've heard, you know, has a past reputation of some really good flatheads in it. Probably river, riverine areas are probably better than, than most. For a person who has catfish, but they've never really targeted a flathead catfish, tell me the, the, the approach that you would take that would be different than fishing for blues or channels. Well, flatheads are, to, in my opinion, one of the ultimate predators mm -hmm. in our waters. So. They do a lot better with a live pre live bait presentation, and uh, so you know I would I would definitely lean toward using some you know like a green sunfish or something like that, uh, a live bait to to catch those fish. Not to say you can't catch them on a lot of other stuff, but because uh, uh, a lot of bass fishermen catch them when they're fishing, and uh, we've all done that. But uh, but more if you're targeting them, I think you're going to be wanting to target you know, using live bait, especially mm -hmm. around large areas of debris, mm -hmm. because that thing right they on like the bottom? To, and, and close to the bottom. Close to the bottom, yeah. All right, uh, Deanna Young wants to know if the white bass population is making any comebacks on Green River Lake. Yeah, I think it is, actually. Um, from looking at the fishing forecast, I think we've upgraded it to good, okay. which it came from pretty much nothing in the lake left to, you know, decent numbers in there. So it, it's making a comeback. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about the uh, the fishing forecast. Mm -hmm. That that comes out in the in this winter to spring. Yeah, it's out it now. Yeah, it just came out. It just came out for 2021. I'll tell you what, if you've got some free time on your hands and you <laughs> want to plan a fishing trip throughout the state of Kentucky, it's a really good resource. Right. Now, it's a pretty comprehensive document. You're looking at, I don't know, 40, 50 pages or so. Yeah, I mean, it has a lot of writing that you could read through if you wanted to, but it also has a cheat sheet at the beginning mm -hmm. where you can actually look through and find the species you're interested in, and, and any lake that has a check mark means it's good or excellent fishing for that. So mm -hmm. it, you can kind of pare down what you're looking for and then just read those sections, or you can go ahead and read the whole dang thing and it, learn all about the lakes. It's amazing. People want to know how, how Fish and Wildlife makes some of the decisions that they make, and based on krill and size limits, but the amount of data that is yeah. gather, gathered, not only through biologists, but through fishing surveys mm -hmm. and public input, 
there's a ton of information that goes in here. So if you want to get online and start looking, this data is available for the most part. Mm -hmm. It's all on there. It's how deep you want to dig. But the fishing report is a really good way to go look at a species or a lake and figure out, okay, if I want to go fish this lake, what, what opportunities are there and what are my chances? It's a good place to yep. start. Yep. So you had a, uh, an upgrade on white bass from... White bass at uh, green has you know, come from pretty much poor because that several years ago, you know, we barely get anything in our samples. Any other uh, species that you've seen go from either fair or poor to, to good or excellent over the last year that we're going to notice on this year's fishing report? Uh, I know you saw guy picked up pretty well. I mean, oh. I'm not sure it was at fair. I think it's yeah. been at good over there or did it just hit good? Yeah, yeah Taylor, Taylor I mean, I, I expect this spring, uh, especially when we get into the white bass run, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's always the white bass run and some hybrids run, but I think you're going to see, a, got a good feeling there's going to be a decent run of saw guy going with that. Last year, there was quite a few saw guy caught in that upper portion of the mm -hmm. lake. We snuck away up there and caught a couple ourselves. Yeah. And so. uh, I tell you what, they're, uh, that's a great fun fish to catch in current and moving water. All right, well, that's great. There you go. You heard it. it <laughs> as if Taylorsville Lake needs more pressure. That's right. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you heard it. There's some big saw guy at Taylorsville Lake. Uh, all right, next question is from a buddy of mine, Greg Brizendine. And he wants to know what the prediction on the uh, shadow kill this winter. I think he means shad. Uh, any prediction on the, he says shadow kill, but I think he means shad kill this, this winter. Uh, that's not uncommon when we have some pretty harsh winters to, uh, have shad die-offs uh, that you know that a portion of a population may die off uh, when we get this real cold nasty weather uh, not sure exactly where we are I mean we'll we'll probably have a better understanding of that in the next couple of, you know in the next month or so mm -hmm. as we start getting a few phone calls about dead fish <laughs> being in various locations I've seen people posting pictures online uh, and this is we've had a couple nights we're here we're doing a show about fishing. We've had the last couple of nights we've had in single digits in a lot of the mm -hmm. state. That's when the shad die starts to happen, right? When it gets real cold, yes. And, and definitely like in a lake like Harrington or some of these lakes that may have uh, thread fin, thread fin don't handle that cold weather at, at all very well. Uh, and you may see a little bit more die off on the, those types of fish, but the shad will, the gizzard shad will also have die offs too. Yeah. I don't know if people are sending pictures and posting pictures on their ponds of what, what fish is this and uh, it, I, I see a bunch of my pond that's dead. Having those dead in your pond may not be a bad thing. You really having a bunch of shad in your pond can be problematic, can it? Yes, that's it, it, not necessarily the best thing to have in a, especially a smaller pond. Mm -hmm. uh, ponds do a lot better when it's just more like bass and bluegill. The, the shad complicate the system a little bit. But you can pick them up and use them for bait, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it can be a good bait. All right, next question, uh, Gerald Ertel. Um, will there be musky stocking done this year? Yes. Um, we stock buckhorn and dewey, green, cave run. The Kentucky River. Kentucky River we'll get um, each year. So those will definitely get stocked. I got all four of the, re yeah, so the four main reservoirs we stock, Dewey, Buckhorn, Cave Run, and Green. Mm -hmm. And then we'll stock the Kentucky River and some other st smaller streams that they're native to okay. as well. So okay. yes, we, we try to stock those every year when we can. We've, we've talked a little bit about uh, muskie stocking. How many muskie approximately do we put in, uh, in Kentucky waters each year? Oh. I don't know the exact number. The reservoirs we stock at like uh, one muskie per third of it no one muskie per three acres maybe? three acres yeah I got it backwards yeah. um, so it's not a high density stocking obviously mm -hmm. but um, I don't know the total number exactly you know uh, the lower part of the like the Kentucky when it gets stocked in my area you're looking at 50 fish to 100 fish in a pool so you know it's it it's a it's an apex predator. It's mm -hmm. it's at the top of the food chain, you know. So you you don't you stock them at a little bit lower rate. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Eric Warner wants to know how big are the state record smallmouth and largemouth bass? This is an interesting interesting question. Who wants to take that? The largemouth is four. It came out of High Splint Lake a couple of years ago. I think it's fourteen nine something. Mm -hmm. And then the smallmouth is it's eleven something. Yeah, eleven. 11 
out of Dale Hollow. Yeah, our, so our, our state record uh, largemouth, interestingly enough, was only two years ago, and right. it was High Split Lake, as yep. you talked about. And then the smallmouth state record just so happens to be the world record. Right. And that's 11 pounds, 15 ounces. It's 15, 15, that's it. 11 pounds, 15 ounces. And that was caught by David Hayes, who unfortunately recently we lost. Mm -hmm. David Hayes uh, lived in Litchfield, and he caught the world record smallmouth bass from, from uh, Dale Hollow Lake at 11 pounds, 15 ounces. So if you beat that one, make sure you give us a call. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to want to talk to you. <laughs> Next question, uh, David Massingill wants to know where Kentucky's biggest bluegill and red ear are located. Everybody wants to know where the red ear are. Well, Out west for sure. I mean, Barkley and Kentucky lakes have really good ones, but I, we've got some smaller lakes that have decent ones. I don't, yeah. you know. Yeah, we, we've got some lakes that are doing really well with, with bluegill and red deer right now here in central Kentucky. Uh, Elmer Davis Lake, Bolts Lake, you know, Corinth Lake, Beaver Lake, those are all lakes that we're managing for uh, panfish, but really, you know, right now Elmer's doing real well, and so is Bolts. Uh, more so bluegill at bolts and some really quality panfish in those lakes. So I, I every now and then I get phone calls from people that send me a picture of a big bluegill and I'll be like the red ear and it and uh, in you know we've got pictures up here that actually the differences of red ear and bluegill and they're marked pretty distinctively different. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you have, do you ever see red ear just show up in a lake that you never have stocked them? They've never been put in there that have either naturally been transported or have been transported by accidental bait or something like that. Uh, I would say more if we see something like that uh, is more like you know an Elkhorn Creek. You know yeah. we may be in the North Fork sampling and we see uh, this batch of really nice red ear for whatever reason, which are probably escapees from a pond from someplace, okay. but uh, not as much in our lakes uh, because you know a lot of those we've stocked and mm -hmm. try to develop that fishery in certain instances. But uh, I can't think of any other place other than maybe some of these streams where some uh, or like. Uh, Harrington, you know, now and then we'll see a big red ear show up. Not a, but we're not talking about a population of, but just individual fish. Again, probably, you know, an escapee out of a pond from uh, within the drainage. But uh, they now and then, you know, but it's it's not something that's common. All right, David Tomlin, uh, when will the white bass start running the Salt River? Probably in March, uh, probably later, say latter part of March, depends on the weather, but as the water's temperature starts hitting that 50 to 55 degree range, yeah, that's gonna be definitely the time in which you're gonna wanna start at least thinking about it. Yeah, there's several streams in Kentucky that's great for white bass runs, but uh, mm -hmm. starting in March and then, and I always make a trip out there a time or two that's a little early, and uh, but getting in there and catching those white bass, and then they'll run for three or four weeks, right? Yes. And uh, some days it's just fantastic and you can't get your line near the water without catching one and some days it's a little tougher, but. Uh, it's weather, weather plays a big portion because you know, with we get big rains and you get a lot of flow going, tur you know, and causing a lot of turbidity can, can really slow it down. But if you get the right conditions, it can be, we'll say game on with catching quite a few fish. So. Okay. Uh, we're getting quite a few people that are asking questions about uh, fish stocking in and around Jefferson County and Louisville. If uh, you lived in the area and you were wanting to get out and do a little fishing, what opportunities exist in, in and around close to Louisville? you got quite a few opportunities, uh, starting with the Fins Lakes. Mm -hmm. we got quite a few Fins Lakes in the, in the Louisville area. Again, check out the website again for those areas. Those are, they get stocked quite a bit, you know, whether trout in the winter, channel catfish uh, or catfish in the summertime. Uh, you've also got uh, McNeely Lake is a department owned lake. Uh, really nice pan fishery. Uh, okay. It's a 50 acre lake. It's, tr it's a trolling motor boat or trolling motor only. Uh, but it's got some it's got some decent bass in it. Uh, it's a nice little fishery. Uh, they're located in Louisville. Uh, you've also got the Floyd's Fork. If you want to do some stream fishing, you got the that's the parklands of the Floyd's Fork. You got 20 miles of that stream that is public access, so you can wade fish, kayak it. It's a it's a beautiful stream. Uh, we do a, a little bit of trout stocking in it in, up in the Beckley Park area uh, this time of year. It's a uh, it's it's a delayed harvest, mm -hmm. so you can, you can only. So we stock it back in October or so through the, the winter months. You have to catch and release the trout after 
in end of March, mm -hmm. I believe is the date, 31st. Yep. After that, you can start. You can harvest some of the trout, but you've you, you've got some stream fishing opportunities. Then you've got McAlpin. Uh, you got the Ohio River there, the fossil beds, and that could be a really enjoyable fishery, and it's doing really well these days. You've had a couple of shows on that recently, so. I tell you what, you now taking a boat down there and heading into McAlpin or or being in above can be can be very dangerous, let's be honest. It, it's a situation where you want to make sure you know what you're doing, but if you want to do some walk-in fishing below the dams um, and get your bank access, there are so many fish that run and pile up in there, and they, they come in in waves. It's like one fish comes up and spawns, and a great fish for that species, you come back two or three weeks later, it's a different species of fish, and they're up in there biting. So it, uh, it's a great fishing opportunity, just make sure you, uh, you're very cautious. Uh, and fishing down and around there, and those fossil beds are very slick, so <laughs> be, be careful. But man, that is probably the most overlooked fishery in all of the state of Kentucky. I'd say it's below the McAlpin Dam. Um, and to kind of to branch off that, a lot of people sometimes get confused. If you're a Kentucky resident, mm -hmm. you can have a fishing license and fish on the Indiana side. Yes. Uh, some people think that they have to buy an Indiana when they go over there. That's a, that's a very good point because we, we a lot of times will park on the Indiana side and walk in to the falls. Or, from mm -hmm. that area and b you're fishing the, the river, yeah. you can fish on a Kentucky fishing license. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Now the only time you'll need a Indiana is whenever you actually go up into a tributary or uh, fish some type of lake up there. Anytime you're getting more into the Indiana side, not just on the Ohio River. Thanks for clarifying that because that's a question that I often get, hey, I'm going to fish from the Indiana shore, I'm assuming I need a Indiana license, mm -hmm. and that's absolutely not the case. So, all right. Next question is uh, from Virgil Evans. He wants it wants us to explain what fish lice are. Anyone can want to give an explanation oh, wow. of fish lice? Okay, <laughs> it, it's a parasite that occurs on fish, and uh, it well sometimes a lot a lot of parasites do kind of catch people off guard. We get a lot of calls about it. Uh, we have a lot of parasites that do occur in our fish, uh, such as, we'll say, grubs. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, when they fillet their fish, they find these white or yellow grubs in the fish fillets. Again, it's part of nature. Uh, they're not harmful to us. Uh, just sometimes they're kind of like watching a horror movie. They're just some of those things that kind of bug you a little bit, you know, <laughs> and I kind of understand that. But they're, they're, they're a parasite. They're, you know, they're an invertebrate that do occur in, in our fish populations at times. All right. Uh, we're getting a couple questions about uh, the status of trout stocking on Laurel River Lake. Uh, now, that is a place that we have stocked in the past. Yep. And to my understanding, last year we did no no stocking there. Is that right? Right. That started last year. We've, we've knocked it down over time. Uh, you mentioned earlier our creel surveys where we go out and survey anglers and uh, over time, we've seen just the harvest of trout and the effort for them has plummeted on Laurel. In fact, it got down to the point where I think, you know, we stocked 50 or 60,000 in and we had 400 harvested. So, mm. you know, it wasn't a good return for our money. We could use those better in Finns Lakes or, mm. or other streams and such. So we've pared that down and have actually ended it this last year. Um, just mainly due to the amount of effort for them and the amount of people actually harvesting those fish. So, uh, you know, we have to pay for those, so we're going to go ahead and put them in places where people can, will, will use them. That's interesting to talk about that because we have three fish hatcheries uh, scattered throughout the state of Kentucky that right. we, we raise a bunch of fish species, but trout's not one of them, right? Yeah, trout is, is, is the third. We have a, a hatchery in Minor Clark mm -hmm. um, up in Moorhead. Mm -hmm. We have a hatchery just north of Frankfurt here at Pfeiffer Fish Hatchery. And then Wolf Creek National Fish Hatchery is down at the base below the dam at Lake Cumberland. Mm -hmm. That's a federal hatchery. Mm -hmm. So they provide trout either through mitigation when they build a dam and change the flows and the temperatures they're required to mitigate. And a lot of those fish they put in are, are trout. And then we pay for some. Uh, Laurel's actually was probably mitigation trout at the time. Um, then we pay for a lot of the trout, like the ones that go into Finns Lakes and such. Mm -hmm. And they raise them all for us, browns and cutthroats and rainbow and brook. Uh, so it's a, it's a good partnership with them and they've been doing it forever. It's a great partnership, but we, we, 
to take certain conditions to raise trout. And for our right. fish hatcheries, for us to say, hey, we want to raise more trout uh, because right. they're being pursued more through fins lakes, it's not something that our fish hatcheries can produce, right? That's, yeah, and the trout production is one of our limiting factors, for sure, for fins lakes and, and our streams. You know, a lot of times we'll think, well, this might make a good stream, but, you know, they have a production capacity based on the number of raceways and their flow through and everything else. So we, we can, can't get past that, so we are always manipulating our tra trout around, you know, the best we can to get the best use for anglers. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the reason for the, the stoppage at Laurel. Mm -hmm. And that's another good point. On our, our warm water hatcheries is that, you know, we have a production plan. So the fish that are raised at these hatcheries already are allotted to go somewhere. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, we, uh, every now and then we do have some surplus on certain fish, that we're able to use for different things, but you know we've got a plan, and you know what's being produced in these uh, hatcheries, at, you know, are going to certain lakes. You know, all this is planned out in advance. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, James Kreider from uh, Prestonsburg wants to know: if, Is there anywhere in Kentucky where the F1 tiger bass has been stocked? Any update on this topic? And he said, "Good fishing. God bless." <laughs> Talk, talk a little bit about what the F1 tiger bass is. Okay, tiger bass, there's, there's some interesting stuff going on out there. There's several different names, but basically F1 tiger bass is actually a cross of uh, the Florida strain largemouth and the northern strain largemouth. And what they're, what they're wanting to do is trying to get the growth potential of the Florida strain along with the aggressiveness of the northern strain. They're trying to get that into a... Uh, uh, a fish that will grow fast and bite. That's the problem with a lot of people fuss about the North, the Florida strain. They're harder to catch. Mm -hmm. You know they have, a, but they have a potential of growing to fairly large sizes. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, honestly, you know, the, we're, we're not looking at that here. Uh, it, it stocking them, uh, but uh, they are. Again, there's some research out there, you know, if it's going to work well at this latitude. Mm -hmm. uh, our northern strain does really well here. And again, we, we're limited on our growing season, you know, uh, and so it, it, that kind of hurts that Florida strain, you know, uh, on the potential. And again, I, I think a lot of the, the longevity of how long these fish live are about the same, uh, whether it's northern or Florida, but again, trying to get that growth potential may be tough here mm -hmm. uh, and again I think there's there's some there's jury still out on that I think at least at our latitude I think you know down south it may work a little bit better than it will here so right now uh, we're not doing anything with F1 tiger no. bass then. No, nothing here in the state of Kentucky now the states that are that are dealing with this F1 tiger bass are they a hybrid species can they reproduce Yes, they can reproduce. They can reproduce. Yes. Okay. And that, that that was one of the things I've read on them before is that they can eventually, as they reproduce, work back toward what the parental fish are. So then you go back to these, you don't get that F1, quote, F1 hybrid. You go back to whether it's a Florida strain or a northern strain. Gotcha. Okay. And then you're kind of back to those two two. Uh, Gotcha. All right. Very Robert ancient. Floyd wants to know, uh, oh, we talked about that. He wanted to know waters for flathead. We discussed that a little bit ago. Kyle Kessinger, any plans of uh, sustaining the blue cat population in Taylorsville Lake? Man, that has been a species of fish that has done really well and has been pursued heavily. Actually, we are going back to stocking them. We pulled off a couple of years so that we could check for natural reproduction in the lake. Mm -hmm. Uh, we did find natural reproduction in the lake, but we're, it's currently we're worried that it's limited. It's not at the level we would like to see it, so we're going back to stock it. And it may be something down the road we look at it again, but as of right now, we are getting some limited reproduction, which is good, uh, but we are going back to stocking them. So yes, we will be stocking blue cats in Taylorsville. Okay, is that something starting in 2021? Uh, it, yeah, we're go it will be done this year, and actually, it look I uh, got an email today. It may be next month. Oh wow! Okay. <laughs> Fantastic. So, so, what was one of the reasons that we introduced blue catfish to Tozville Lake? Uh, one is trying to provide an additional fishery, uh, really kind of a trophy fishery to a degree, mm -hmm. uh, because of their ability you know, to grow a little bit larger than a than a. Uh, 
uh, a channel can, and that's kind of the dominant catfish over there. There are a few flatheads in Taylorsville, but uh, it, they've done really well. We had a, we had a great for, we've got a great forage base over there of shad. If anybody's been there and fished it, they understand what I'm saying. But uh, but again, it, it's been a nice additional fish that's provided an awesome fishery that's been very very popular. So what if you've never caught a blue catfish that? Uh, you know, everybody always wants to say pound for pound. You know, they talk about bluegill being a great fighting fish, and they are. But blue catfish are a great fighting fish, and they're big. Yeah. So you put that combination together. I mean, that that is probably the one of the hardest fighting fish in the state of Kentucky. Yeah. A lot of fun to pursue, that's for sure. Uh, Sharky502 from Instagram wants to know what he can expect to catch on the Green River near Greensburg this year. Apparently, he's going to fish that 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 area. You got smallmouth and. I don't know if muskie get into that area or probably. not. Probably. Okay. Um, any of the black bass species should be mm -hmm. good. Um, we don't have a lot of information on that. If you look in our fishing guide, they got all our biologists listed by counties and mm -hmm. whatever, and they, um, he, they'd be happy to, you know, give them some good pointers on what we, he needs to be targeting. We floated that section, uh, I believe it was last year, or close to that section, and. Uh, great population of bass. Yep. It's got a great population. And they're eating something. Right. So <laughs> there's there's obviously panfish in there as well. Yeah. So uh, there's, a, there's a, 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 a nice population of spotted bass, largemouth bass, and a ton of smallmouth bass. Yeah, it's a, Green River is a great smallmouth and, yeah. and rock bass. Yeah. You know, it's, a, yeah. it's a great fishery. Uh, Mary Elston wants to know, are sauger in the Kentucky River? Yes. Uh, we stock them. <laughs> yeah. uh, so yes, there are sauger in the Kentucky River and uh, we annually stock them and uh, the lower part of the river, we'll say, you know, those lower, say, pools, one, we'll say lock dams one, two, and three, you know, have the potential of getting some of the Ohio River influence because there's a great sauger population in the Ohio River. So, uh, but yeah, there's, there's some sauger to be caught. Okay. It's always interesting when we talk about uh, lower and upper. We're talking about the way the river flows. So when you look at a map and you say the lower part of Kentucky River, it's actually north. Right. Right. <laughs> so it's, when you say lock one, twos, and threes, we're coming from the Ohio River down one, two, and three, and that's the area you're referring to. Yes. It's always, anytime I tell someone lower, then they go, okay. So and they look at a map and they, their mind tells them to go south. <laughs> Got to know which way the river's flowing to know which yep. way the lower is. So. Yeah. That is uh, from the Ohio River down. Right. All right. Um, next, uh, next question is uh, Brandon Williams. How many jugs can a person put out at one time? I assume this person is catfishing. Yes, yeah, so you can uh, up to 50. Okay. And that is, that is something that's different than five or six years ago because it was per person or something. Now it's per mm -hmm. boat, right? Yes. And the, yeah, if you have two people in the boat, it's 50. Is if you have three maximum. people in the boat? Uh, 50. It's still 50, yeah. so it's by boat. And that's a lot. I mean, that's 50 jugs is a lot. It's a lot to manage. It, it is, sure. yes, yeah. especially all the string. and. So sort of regardless of the number of fishermen, it's 50 per licensed yes. license angler in the boat, right? Yes. I and mean, then, I'm sorry, 50 per boat, regardless of how many licensed anglers yes, are in the yeah, boat. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I made it more confusing myself. So, <laughs> <laughs> Next question is uh, from Don Mattingly. Said he saw a lot of sturgeon caught below Wolf Creek Dam this past year. How's that program going? Any updates on sturgeon? They're doing well. I mean, people are catching them. Uh, we continued. I don't know what year we're in for stocking, but it, it's we've stocked for many, many years mm. as a restoration effort for the lake sturgeon. Um, our stockings have been above Cumberland Lake, but mm. they've worked their way down, and we're getting you know reports of below Wolf Creek, but they're catching them up above. Um, night crawlers and things like that. Now people need to remember there's no harvest on those fish while we're in this restoration project so they need to let them go but they're yeah. catching them. It's one of those things where you catch one of these it's probably gonna be the biggest fish you ever caught right. in your entire life and people don't understand the need to put that fish back but sturgeon have to live to about what age for reproduction? I think it's probably is it seven or it's beyond that. It's probably seven, ten years, somewhere in that. We yeah. haven't seen any natural reproduction yet, have we, by sturgeon? I don't, I don't think, so. think so. No. So that's why it's very, very important to put these fish back in. Yeah. We, if they're not reproducing at all, you can see how quickly that can go yeah. south. Those so. are long-lived fish, and it, you know, it's definitely important for those older fish to be in the population. But they can get to enormous sizes, yeah. right? Yeah. What, Lake what, sturgeons can get big. What, uh, what size can we expect 30, 40 years from now, potentially? Oh. We have a state record, but I'm not sure what the, the weight is. Sure. I mean, I mean they, they 
got to be up there in the blue cat size or yeah, over 100 pounds. Yeah, yeah. One yeah. of these days we're going to see it. We're going to remember when there weren't any. That's that's a, that's a cool program. Um, next question, Sarah Kuhn. Uh, do you have to have a paper fishing license on you or a screenshot on your phone work? We get this question quite a bit, mm -hmm. uh, especially with this new technology uh, mm -hmm. going on. You have to have, uh, to be able to prove a license, you mm -hmm. can screenshot it, that's perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem with that is that if you don't have it si signed, which there's one gentleman I checked, he actually did a digital signature on his screenshot, which I thought was pretty neat. <laughs> um, but if, if, if you don't have a paper license, you have it screenshot on your phone, you have to have your driver's license with you so that we can match it up and know that you were the person who has it. Yeah. Um, okay. So yes, being screenshot on your phone is perfectly fine. Uh, the things about having it on your phone is that if the battery dies, how are you going to show us? Um, if it gets wet and you destroy If it gets phone. wet. Uh, another thing is, you know, a lot of people like to take pictures. So, you know, not that we want to sit there and wait for you to go through 500 pictures to find it. If you could try to put it somewhere pretty mm -hmm. easily to pull up mm -hmm. um, instead of us sitting there waiting for about 10 minutes for you to <laughs> find it, that would benefit us. But just keep in mind that a digital is going to be, it's better to always have paper. And yeah. you can print them off if you lose it. That's a great thing. Website. It used to be, uh, you know, used to be a little more trouble to obtain a copy of your fishing license. And now you just, I mean, everyone, everyone who's got a fishing license has a My Profile. They can log mm -hmm. right on to their My Profile. The Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources, you can print off your boater safety certificate. You can print off your hunter safety certificate. You can print off your fishing license. You can also check your harvest log. So there's a whole lot of benefits there to going on your My Profile and logging in. So if you have a license, it's, uh, you only need two or three pieces of data, which I'm sure you know it. I think it's your last name and last, last name, four. date of birth, and date of birth. last four year social. Last four year social, you can get on there and check all that information out. It's really, it's really, really cool. It sees everything you've ever applied for, every animal you've ever harvest, mm -hmm. harvested. If Quota you have hunts. preference points, for duck hunting, it keeps it all. So uh, if you've never been on there, check that out. Uh, next question from Joseph Riley. Wants to know if he can uh, use a throw net in the spillway stocked with trout. I don't think he wants to catch trout, but he wants to know, can he use it to catch bait fish? Yeah, just make sure you're not below a dam. Yeah. Um, that's, the, that's the biggest thing when you're in a spillway. Uh, and then there's if you pick up one of our fishing guides, it'll go into specifics on the size of the netting that you can use and uh, everything like that. But yes, if you give our headquarters a call and uh, they'll be, able, or go on our website and look up the specific area that he might be going if there's any uh, restrictions to that. So for people that don't understand what a person would want to throw a uh, throw net for, that is mm -hmm. he's trying to catch bait. Bait, I'm assuming, yes. right? So mm -hmm. he's trying to catch bait. Obviously, he's talking about if there's trout there, he doesn't want any accidental catches. Correct. If yeah. you accidentally catch something in a throw net, which is going to happen from time mm -hmm. to time, Tell me what you need to do uh, there. Sport fish of any kind, if you catch that, you need to immediately release it. Uh, also, a lot of people, some I've came across, didn't realize this, but that is a form of fishing. Mm -hmm. So you need to have a fishing license to be able to catch that. And you gotta be, you gotta be cautious too on what's considered a sport fish. We talked mm -hmm. about red ear earlier. Red ear sunfish are considered sport fish now, right? Unless they're six, less than six inches or yeah, six, six inches, inches or, or more than that. Okay, so if you're throwing a cast net and catching those, then you gotta be very cautious yeah. there as well. And another important thing about those cast nets, if you are going after shad or, you know, it, with the Asian carp issues mm -hmm. that we've got, oh, yes. uh, you need to be, you know, you can only use them in the water bodies that you catch them out of. You okay. can't be transporting them. Yeah, you know, mo moving, moving shad or bait from one location to another is a bad, bad idea yeah. for a whole lot of reasons. So mm -hmm. they have to be used. If you catch them out of that body of water, you, you have to use them on that body of water. Correct. Now, if you were fishing, in the Cumberland River and you caught them on Lake Cumberland, can you then fish with them on Cumberland River? Is you're that not, classified as the same I body I think the water? regulations read that you're not supposed to take them out onto a road and transport, so yes. I would assume that yeah. you'd probably be still violating. What if you didn't fish with them alive? What if you oh, took them and you if they're dead. took them and froze them mm -hmm. and then brought them and you're allowed to If they're dead, need, it's different. If yeah. they're dead, they're different. You need to make sure they're dead before you head home. Okay, so freedom. they have to be disposed of before. Yeah, you don't want to be on the road with live shad or gotcha. herring or gold eye, moon eye. Okay, all right, there you go. Um, next question from David Spaulding. Who has the right of way when fishing, bank fishermen or boat fishermen? <laughs> Can you solve this age-old question? Oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, 
really just comes down to being sportsman centric to each yeah. other. Yeah. Um, I mean, if the gentleman's on the bank and he's there first, uh, you know, whenever I fish in a boat, I try to go all the way around him mm -hmm. so I'm not messing up. He's on a bank. He can only go so far. Yeah. I'm in a boat. I can go a whole. I can go to several other places, um, and vice versa. If yeah. you're on a bank and there's a guy that's in a boat fishing, I mean, just be use some common sense and some, uh, I guess, old-fashioned niceness and <laughs> try to go somewhere else. There's not a written law on who who has the yeah. actual uh, who has the actual right there's of not. way when it comes to casting, right? There's not. <laughs> All right. Next question, uh, Jay Coates. What's the long-term plan for Linville Lake in Rock Castle County? There have been so many different species of fish introduced over the past several years. Yeah. Now, are these fish, I, I know some of these species they're talking about, are these fish that we have introduced or they've been introduced through other means? Uh, both. Or both, okay. Uh, so there's paddlefish in Linville. Um, those fish are part of a contract that uh, Linville Water District or whatever has with a, a reservoir rancher and they're allowed to do those type contracts in water supply lakes. Mm -hmm. So the paddlefish that are in there are kind of part of a project contract with, you know, a couple entities. We don't have anything to do with that. The hybrid striped bass that are in there are stocked by us and mm -hmm. those will continue. He probably saw us stock saw guy in there for one year and we did that, but then we dug in deeper into our native walleye program and we realized that they could potentially get out of Linville and somehow mix in with our native walleye. We don't want that happening, so we stopped that stocking. Okay. If we didn't have the native walleye project going on, you know, in waters that those fish could get to, we'd probably still be stocking saw guy, but we had we stopped it just to be safe. Now we, we also the, put bass in there when it needs it. Okay. On the ones that we have stocked but they've made their way in there somehow, uh, I, I think Linville's like I keep getting pictures of uh, yellow perch. Yeah. So yellow perch is maybe what they're asking about too. It, Tell it me a little bit be. about yellow perch in Linville. They're Lake. actually doing pretty well, which is surprising. <laughs> um, I think they're getting up to 12 to 14 inches, which is pretty good for a yellow perch yeah. around here. Now those we don't not, have them in too many. They're not native. Yeah. They're obviously established in that one area, and how they got there, who knows? But that's you know, not something that we did. Obviously. We didn't do it. It probably came in bait bucket or somebody tried to start them up there mm -hmm. yeah. and it took hold but you don't always want that to happen you know look at Asian carp you don't want to be moving fish that aren't native around the state just so if you catch a, if you catch a perch in uh, in Linville Lake there's no size or uh, no. length constriction because it's not a native fish to yeah and they're good to eat so <laughs> take, take as many as you can out of there if you catch it it's a bonus and yep. try to catch another <laughs> There you go. Um, next question, uh, Cole Babb wants to know what the legalities of using a cast net to catch bait. We talked a little bit about mm. that. Um, main, the main thing here, the main takeaway seems to be the fact that uh, if you do catch some shad or bait, you can't take it to the road without dispatching to those fish and killing those fish, right? Yeah, and in reg there's also a list, and I, there's no way I'm going to remember, but there's a certain number of each type of bait fish and other types of live bait that you can have, so just make sure you know what the limit is for collecting bait fish. And, the, and releasing any sport fish that yeah. you catch. Okay, all right. But you're not, I don't think you're allowed to use those cast nets and like water bodies under 500, 500 acres. acres owned by so the department. So our small department owned lakes, mm -hmm. throwing cast nets would be illegal. Okay, but, okay. But uh, they're more reservoirs oriented, we'll say the bigger reservoirs. Okay, I know a lot of, Striper guides. I mean, they take cast nets mm -hmm. out and catch alewives and, and shad. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's what they use. If you go out there, you're going to you're going to probably use <laughs> some form of uh, live bait caught right there in the lake. I'll tell you what, it's a rough it's a rough gig being a, uh, a a guide out there on that lake. Their their mornings a lot of times start at three o'clock. They're trying to catch bait. So mm -hmm. uh, that that's where they use those cast nets quite frequently. Uh, Adam Fields, do the stock trout in Otter Creek die off in warmer temps, or do do they just become inactive? No, they're they're dying off because we're getting we got temperature loggers that we put in there because we we've had a lot of reports of fish holding over through the mm -hmm. summer, but even in late June the water up near the park part of the of the creek is 80 degrees and trout aren't gonna you know and it only gets worse from there so most likely if they're seeing bigger fish in the spring or something there's also cool water 
that they can hold over in up in Fort Knox. Okay. There's some spring-fed, I know there's a spring-fed lake up there and I don't know what else, but there's some areas that they probably could make it through the summer up there. And if those fish move down, it may look like they're holding over in the park part of the creek, but they probably came from that cooler water up above. You, know, you mentioned a little bit ago as far as certain, certain times of the year when trout are caught, they must be immediately released in certain bodies of water mm -hmm. and there's zero harvest or take of that fish until whatever the date is. Right. October 1st to March 31st. And the, and the reason for that is those fish are really put in there for fishing opportunities, right? Mm -hmm. After the date of April March, 1st. March 31st. March 31st. So April. The, we expect those fish to start dying, right? Yeah, several, you know, a couple months out from there, so yeah. That's, but we want someone to oh, yeah. utilize the fish yep. rather than just letting it die. So yep. that's the yep. reason those dates are set. Is yeah, when the water get temperature gets up around 75, that's pretty lethal to a trout, and that happens probably sometime in mid-June. And, and, and that's when it starts happening? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, so it's a good idea after that date. I don't, even if you're, a, you know, a, an avid fly fisherman who loves that trout, you catch one at start, starting later in the, mm -hmm. in the spring, in the summer, the fish is probably not going to make it. I mean, it's a put and take resource. You might as well have to go ahead and take that resource yeah. and put it to good use. Yeah. And if you keep the trout, you need to have a trout stamp. There you go. As well. and, and there's other, there's a few places you don't need to have, uh, but for majority of the waterways, right. if you're going to be keeping trout, you need to have a trout stamp. Which is included in your sportsman's license. Sportsman's right? and the uh, senior disabled license. Interestingly enough, uh, we're right here on that time of year. I mean, it's time to start fishing. We're supposed to have temperatures next week <laughs> in the upper 50s. South, southern Kentucky may touch 60 in the 10-day forecast. Hey, it's time to get that fishing license. So you, know, you know what's going to happen. You're going you're gonna to look outside and you're going to say, man, I've seen snow for five straight days and now look, it's 60 degrees. You're going to want to get out there. Fishing licenses do expire at the end of this month, so you want to make sure that uh, if you're going to want to hit the water pretty soon, you get online or get to one of your local retail stores that carries a fishing license and go ahead and get that taken care of. So uh, this is our last question. The last question, it is from um, Megan on Instagram. Where do the smallmouth bass go in big lakes in the spring? Do they stay on the main lake or move up into the creeks? There you go. Megan wants to go catch some big smallmouth. Big smallmouth, I think. I, uh, if we're looking at springtime, I'd be look. Personally, I'd be looking in the creeks. Doesn't mean you can't find a few out on the main lake, but uh, I'd be myself be up in the creeks looking, especially in those spawning flats. And tell us about te water temperature. I mean, I, you look at the water temperature, and it's going to kind of tell you where, what 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 um, stage that they're in. Right. Stage being you know, spent their life or the winter time out there eat deep eating bait balls to moving up to, to uh, shallower waters. What temperature does a smallmouth start to make that transition and what temperature do they actually build a bed and start spawning? Uh, I think you're gonna, they're a little bit cooler than the probably largemouth are, but I, basically I would be, as we start getting back up into that 45, 50 degree temperature mark, I think those fish will start moving. Mm -hmm. uh, as you get into those mid 50s, you know, I was, you know, again, uh, you're, I, again, 55, give or take, is probably going to be more of the time frame. Maybe 60 degrees is when you're going to be looking for them to spawn. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in each year, again, that's going to be dependent on our weather because our weather kind of changes a little bit from year to year. But, uh, but yeah, come March, uh, a lot of these fish are going to start moving shallow. I'd say by late March, early April, I think you're looking at, for at least for smallmouth, is probably their spawn time. I mean, uh, what depth of water do you typically see smallmouth uh, spawning in? I think it, they could be, it, again, given the different bodies of water, you know, streams, you know, you could find them, you know, in a, a foot or two foot of water, probably down to seven, eight feet of water, mm -hmm. uh, if the habitat's right, mm -hmm. they find a spot they like. So you're, you're recommending to Megan to, to look in those creeks and, hey, smallmouth only need the bank really one time a year, right? And that's the spawn and yep. that's, the, that's the time of year that she's giving us is when they're making that run to do that. So mm -hmm. start, start looking for shallower water in that March time frame is what you're saying, right? I'd say late March. Yeah, late March. All right, well, I'll tell you what, it was a, it was a great year. Uh, the, the coronavirus and uh, the COVID-19 obviously pay, played havoc on a lot of us, but more people took to the water 
and I sure hope that continues to happen this year. Start making your plans and your trips now because, hey, the time of year to really get excited about fishing is now. You think about a normal year, we would already finished up our boat shows. It's time to hit the, it's time to start thinking about hitting the water and the best time to fish, March and April in my opinion, March, April and May, it's, it's, it's right around the corner. It's, it's literally next week. So make sure that uh, you get your fishing license and uh, get out there and start pursuing some of, some of the fun fishing we have throughout the state of Kentucky. Hey, I want to thank all of our guests. Thank you for joining us again. We, we battled through a, uh, a, a pandemic <laughs> and a snowstorm, but we're here to get you guys out on the water and fishing. Thanks a lot. I'm Chad Miles, your host here of Kentucky Afield.